Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. At a talk recorded on the 7th of December 2015, Barry Smith discussed the philosophy of taste. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to be here in the North East. The last time I was here, about three weeks ago, I was on the other side of the river at Gateshead in a very bad-tempered debate about um, alcohol. And uh, I was... <laughs> Three people very much against it and me. You can guess which side I was on. I was actually pro having pleasure out of some of the things that we drink, if we drink in moderation. So it's very nice to come and talk about um, the experience of taste and flavour instead of just putting my hands over my head and my tin hat on to talk to people who don't want to talk about that at all. So I thought I'd try and uh, talk to you about taste from a, a philosophical point of view and then move to why I think the nature of the philosophy has changed because of what we're learning from the science. And that's maybe a little bit strange. Uh, why does a philosopher need to have the science? And I think the answer is that if we're asking philosophical questions, they've got to be based on the right evidence and the right description of the phenomena. And if we mistake the phenomena, we'll have very clever philosophical views, but they will be starting from the wrong assumptions and they will be starting from a completely false view of what tasting is and what taste is, and then we'll make big mistakes. So let me get to it through the philosophy first and then I'll bring in the science later and I'll show you, I hope, how that plays a role and contributes to our philosophical thinking. So I'm very attracted to the ideas of the great Scot, David Hume, who thought that our view of beauty and our understanding of judgments of taste was a matter that pervaded every aspect of our ordinary lives and thinking. So David Hume thought that when we're judging, when we're judging great works of literature, works of art and music, we're starting from a position in which we take ourselves to be capable of making discrimination between what's good and what's bad, or what's better and what's less good. So the idea is that when we're judging aesthetically, we're actually exercising something which we have been exercising since birth, a way of making discriminations which we made in tasting our food, in making judgments about where we would like to sit and how we want to arrange things at our breakfast table. In other words, Aesthetic judgments, when they reach up to be very high-minded and significant, and they talk about the, uh, the great works of art, they are continuous with judgments that we make in a very ordinary and everyday way. Judgments of taste, quite literally judgments about the taste and the quality of what we eat and drink and preferences about what, which dishes we prefer and which other ones we reject. Now, taste as a form of discrimination starts from birth, it probably starts in utero, that you're actually exercising those discriminations about what's nice and what's nasty. And you wanted to say that um, if we put all of these things on a continuous line, then judgments about the pleasures of eating or drinking, uh, what fashion, what we like to see around us every day, that those will be scaled up when we start to talk about literature. But for Hume, the most important thing about judgments of taste was that we had to make these um, assessments of better and worse. And for that, we need standards of taste. Judgments of taste for Hume are not going to be purely subjective. They're not going to be purely uh, idiosyncratic. Um, you know, I like Barry Manlow and you like Bach, and that's all there is to it. It's not going to be like that. He's going to say, no, there's a way in which Bach is better than Barry Manlow and that we should not be afraid to say that. We should think that there are some judgments we can make about what's better and what's worse. And in Hume's day, he talked about it being a very funny thing to say that Milton was a lesser poet than Ogilby. Have we heard about Ogilby? No. But Ogilby was a you know, Scottish poet of the day and probably given a certain amount of attention. And he thought that we had to make these judgments, and in making those judgments, we were sort of insisting there was a, a standard of good taste or there's a standard of good judgment. Now, that view 
that there's a standard of good judgment leads us to ask, well, who sets the standard? And where do we get the standard from? What counts as good taste and bad taste? And who says what counts as good taste and bad taste? And Hume thought the people who set the standard are the good judges. And he didn't think that any one of us couldn't be a good judge. He didn't think that was reserved for people with some special sort of discernment or some special capacity. He just thought they were people who were um, free of prejudice, had lots of experience, were willing to discuss, did not exercise uh, narrowness in their judgment. And he thought that when you had all of these qualities and you brought people together to discuss what was good and what was bad, good judges would, he thought, pretty much coincide in talking about what were the criteria that made something better than something else. Now, as I say, I'm attracted to that view, but it has come in for a lot of stick. That view has been uh, really, really seriously out of fashion for a very long time, and it's been attacked both from above and from below. It's been attacked from above, as I like to say, by very high-minded people who say, it's trivialising the arts and it's trivialising you know, the finest things of artistic production to compare them to eating a piece of horse flesh or drinking a claret. That's just you know, much, much lower down the scale of significance. So you've got these high-minded people who dismiss the idea of judgments of taste as being continuous with tasting our food and making judgments about preference of quality in our food. But you've also got criticisms of that view from below and the criticisms of, from below say, look, what's going to happen is that the so-called good judges, the ones who set the standard for what counts as good taste, will probably just be an elite who belong in the drawing room. And it's the consensus of a certain elite who get together and persuade everybody else that their opinion is somehow better or more authoritative. And people will feel sort of intimidated by these folk and that they'll end up having to defer to it. And so the, so the explanation goes, there's no authority that a certain group of people have. There's no right that some people have to, to call themselves good judges. And on that view, everybody's opinion is as good as anybody else's. Everybody's view is worthy of, of an opinion. And in fact, there's no good taste, there's no bad taste, there's just your taste and my taste. And the talk of there being a standard of taste is actually just an illusion. So now we've got two views. We've got an elitist view which says the arts are too precious to compare them to mere discrimination about our food or things that we might uh, prefer when, when choosing dishes or choosing wines. We've got that elitist view. And then you've got the populist view. The populist view, nobody should be allowed to say what's better or what's worse. It's up to every, every one of us to decide. Now, there's something to be said for the populist view because it reinstates the democracy of taste. You know, make the judgment yourself. Don't be influenced by other people. Don't be intimidated by what someone tells you is supposed to be a finer work of art or piece of music, whatever. So that there's, there's something right about it. But there's also something wrong about it when it says we're abolishing the idea of one thing being better than another. There is no such thing as judging that something is actually very tasteful or judging that something is a better uh, painting or a better uh, composition of music or a better uh, piece of sculpture. There's something wrong with that. Now, the elitist view, which says, um, you know, we must not compare our finest judgments, our, works, <coughs> our judgments about works of art, to something like mere gustatory taste, that view... Um, tends to, at its extreme, take on the populist view. It takes it on head-on and says, look, you know, um, who cares if the general public don't get it and don't understand a fine work of art? Now, uh, probably all of us have been at, either heard listening to, the, to, to, to this on the radio or been to a concert where somebody steps forward and says, I'm now going, we're now going to play our composition of music. It's, um, you know, it's in 12 tone. Uh, it lasts for seven minutes. Uh, we're going to sort of pull the fret strings while somebody bangs a cup, and you know, and, and some piece of contemporary music, and if they're lucky, only lasts eight minutes. 
And there's this horrible screeching noise. Some of you might be thinking of John Cage's sort of extreme pieces. And you think, oh my God, that's just bloody awful. That's really unbearable. And I have been at dance performances. Here we are in Dance City. I've been at dance performances where the poor dancers have been uh, of Merce Cunningham's um, company have been trying to dance while this John Cage music is sort of screeching in the background. And I thought, if I could get just one shot off and could take the violinist out, you know, the whole thing would be, <laughs> whole thing would be much better. But look, there are elitists who will say, there are elitists who will say that's because you, Barry, just don't get it. You haven't got the skill of discrimination. You haven't got the understanding. And there's a famous essay by Milton Babbitt, another contemporary of Cage and a, a composer of uh, atonal music, who said, the public aren't expected to understand nuclear physics or just to suddenly understand some complex piece of mathematics. So why do they think they can understand a piece of music, a very complicated and skillful composition of the kind that I, Babbitt, or Cage produce? Why well, think that you can just get it without any training? And this, this essay, I love the title of this essay, it's called, Who Cares If You Listen? And he said that he shouldn't even bother trying to make his works accessible to the general public. He should just resist this, he should just go off and, and play to private audiences and just engage in electronic compositions of his own kind. So extreme elitism, you know, only a few of us are good enough to get it and nobody else can. Extreme populism, which says everybody's views as good as anybody else, there's no such thing as better or worse, it's just your taste and my taste. Well, I think neither of these views are very attractive, and I think we've got ourselves into a mess where we're forced to choose between those two, as though they're the only options. And they share a common assumption. They share a common assumption, which is that there's no fact of the matter about... Um, that, that can be generally understood by ordinary perceivers about what counts as being good or bad. Because the populist view is, it's just a matter of opinion. It's just opinion. So why should the opinions of an elite count rather than the opinions of each one of us? Democracy of taste. And the sort of extreme version of elitism is, only I can get it. Probably you don't understand it at all. Which, which leaves us wondering, well, if only you can get it, maybe it is only for you, and it's not actually something that really is available. So neither of these views are very good. And I want to try and defend a view in the middle. Remember, the elitists reject the idea of taste as being relevant. It's about higher cognition. It's about some superior way of discerning or perceiving what's going on. And I think that's, I think that's wrong, but also I think uh, the idea... Thank you. In my corner. <laughs> Let's see but I also think it's, it's wrong because it's, got a, it's based on a faulty view of what taste is. Taste and tasting. So the, the view that allows us to dismiss mere taste, is the mere taste aesthetic, is a view according to which taste can't support judgments about art because taste and judgments of taste are just individual, private sensations you have when you're eating or drinking something. Taste is something utterly subjective. The idea is you pop something in your mouth, you chew, you sip, you swallow, and how it is for you, just the way it is for you, is a matter of sensations on your tongue. It's very personal. It's going on in your mouth. It's up close and personal. That's all that taste is. So according to the elitist view, that can't be good enough to get fine judgment and discernment about something as complicated as works of literature or music. On the other hand, the populist view says, given that taste is just about your own sensations, your own private, intimate experiences, how does it taste to you? Then it can't be a matter of getting something objectively right. But they're fundamentally wrong about the nature of taste. And we need to update and talk about what tasting is, because if we now look at what actually happens when we're tasting something, I want to defend a view according to which tasting is hard, not easy. It's not about making subjective judgments. It's about getting things objectively right or wrong, and that you need skill and training to do that. So let me go for that. 
first thing is that we fundamentally misunderstand the nature of tasting, even just ordinary tasting, tasting foods. Because we think we taste with our tongue, but in fact our tongue gives us very little information, very little. All you get from your tongue is salt, sweet, sour, bitter, savoury or umami, metallic. If you cut your finger and you pop it in your mouth, you'll taste the metallic taste of your own blood. Those are what the receptors on the tongue give you. That's all you get. Salt, sweet, sour, bitter, savoury, metallic. That's it from the tongue. But you can taste pineapple, mango, mint, melon, strawberry, chicken, beef, lamb, cinnamon, cucumber. We don't have cucumber receptors on the tongue. <coughs> all of that is smell. All of that smell. Everything that you're getting is coming from your sense of smell. So, if you take something, you can do this experiment at home. If you take, um, I should have brought you a packet of jelly beans, I do this all the time for people. If you hold your nose tightly closed, as if you were going underwater, and you pop a jelly bean in your mouth and you start chewing, you can do it with a piece of cheese, you can do it with a piece of fruit, chew, chew, chew. Holding the nose, all you'll get is some sweetness, maybe some sourness. And then you let go of your nose and you say, oh, pineapple, oh, cherry, mango. So most of what we call taste is smell. But we don't need to stop there. Touch is also involved. Touch is important because how sticky or crunchy or creamy is the thing that you're eating. And that makes a difference because not only do you feel something in your mouth, it contributes to what we call the taste of what you're eating. How creamy something is will determine how sweet you find it. A lot of people think that double cream is sweet, but of course there's no sugar in it at all, it's fat. But the slipperiness, the, the, the spelt-like quality of it on the tongue, bluffs the tongue into thinking that it's sweetness. Some people even think that vodka is sweet, pure vodka, and that's just because of the oily slipperiness of it, not because of them tasting something sweet in the, in the liquid. There are also these interactions between taste and smell. Think of vanilla ice cream. Vanilla ice cream is an amazing concoction, not just of food manufacturers, but of brains like ours. If I handed around a pod of vanilla for you to smell, and I say, well, how does it smell? People often say, it smells sweet. But remember, sweet's a taste, not a smell. So already we've discovered that we're quite confused about taste and smell, now they combine. Plus, if I nipped a little bit of the vanilla pod off and I gave it to you to eat, there's no sweetness in it at all. In fact, it's quite bitter, quite licorice-like. So why do we think vanilla is sweet? Well, the answer is that we usually combine the aroma of vanilla, vanilla extract, with things that are sweet, like ice cream and chocolate and custard and cake. And because we combine the aroma with sweetness, the brain has learned that when I get that smell of vanilla, it's usually accompanied by sweetness on the tongue, so expect sweetness and now transfer some of the properties of what we're calling sweet back onto what is really a smell. Sme sweet doesn't have a smell. Sweet is just sweet. Salt doesn't have a smell. Instead, what we can get are smells which remind us of the things that are combined with them. Now, people in Southeast Asia who don't have a Western diet and have been brought up by combining vanilla with salt or with fish. For them, when they smell vanilla, it won't smell sweet, it'll smell salty. So that shows you that what we're calling the flavor of vanilla, one of the favorite flavors of the ice cream manufacturers, it is actually this wonderful coalescence in the brain of combining sweetness from the tongue, odor in the nose, putting them together, and then they can't be divorced. Now, touches in there too, when you have uh, crisps, and you're eating crisps or biscuits, if you leave them out for a day or two, they go stale, not very nice. And you say they taste stale. What does that mean? In the first day or so, the taste and smell properties of those potato chips or biscuits won't be so different. In fact, if I ground them up, both fresh and stale, and put them in your mouth, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. The difference is the way they crumble. And you don't like the way they crumble after a day or two because it's predicting decay. It's predicting how they will decay. 
So we say it tastes stale. So taste stale is a feel, not actually a taste initially. It's not, it's not a taste, it's a feel. It's the way that it crumbles. And then we can play tricks. My uh, friend and collaborator Charles Spence, a psychologist in Oxford, won the Ig Nobel Prize for his work on Pringles. Fantastic. And, and Pringles are great for an experimenter because they're all identical. You don't have to control for the size and shape. They're all identical. So he was, he was feeding these stale Pringles to hungry undergraduates, and they were eating them. Mmm, tastes stale. But it turns out, when you put headphones on and you amplify the high-frequency sound of your own crunching, they taste fresh. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Which is, which is, by the way, why, why the crisp manufacturers put them in noisy bags, you know, which drives everybody crazy in the cinema. So those noisy bags, that's just to make your brain think fresh, fresh, fresh. So now, is fresh a taste? Is it a feel? Is it a sound? What is it? And what we're beginning to see is that when we are tasting something, it's multisensory. It's always the amalgam of many senses working together to provide you with an experience of the properties of your food. And we're not done yet. We've got yet more senses that go to work here. There's my favourite, the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is the one that serves the eyes, the nose and the mouth. And it's the one that rings bells when you have too much mustard or wasabi. And when you do, where do you feel it? Here, bridge of the nose, right? You don't feel it in the mouth, it's the bridge of the nose that hurts and stings. And in fact, your eyes will begin to water. And your eyes begin to water because the trigeminal nerve which is serving the eyes thinks the eyes are being attacked, so it floods them to protect them. And trigeminal stimulation is given to you by CO2, by bubbles in fizzy drinks like champagne or fizzy sodas. So fizzy soda is a, is a, a little bit of a trick on our senses because Trigeminal stimulation through carbonation suppresses sweetness and accentuates sourness. So that might be why, if, if you ever try this, you can drink Coca-Cola when it's fizzy and when it's cold, because cold also accentuates bitterness and sourness. But when it's warm and flat, it's almost unpalatable, the amount of sugar. It's far too sweet. So fizzy drinks are a kind of device to allow you to ingest almost as much sugar as you can bear without noticing and then you want more. Very bad thing. Very bad thing. Now, what we're seeing is that as well as touch, taste, smell, the trigeminal nerve, and also um, senses like your mechanoreceptors, when you're crunching or biting, your mechanoreceptors are telling you that something is... Uh, crunchy or chewy. That's also contributing to the quality of the taste, as we say. Sichuan pepper. Have you had Sichuan pepper before in food? It gives you a very funny sensation. Your tongue seems to both be numb and tingling. People say it's a bit like licking uh, a 9-volt battery. You get that kind of tingling sensation on the tongue, like electricity. And people think it's a spice, but it's not really. What it does... It's got a compound called hydroxyalpha-sanchyl. It stimulates the mechanoreceptors so that your tongue and your lips vibrate at 50 hertz. That's what it's doing. It's a 50 hertz vibration. So vibration is in there. Trigeminal stimulation is in there. Feel across the tongue is in there. Smell is in there. Taste is in there. It's enormously complicated. It's one of the more complicated things your brain does putting all of that sensory information together and coming up with a single, unified, conscious experience of the flavour of something. And when we realise that it's so complex in sensory terms, then you realise that when we're trying to make judgments about flavour, we often miss quite a lot because it rushes by so quickly. You know, you start tasting as soon as something enters your mouth. And then pretty much the most important thing that people are paying attention to is, do I like it or not like it? Do I want to spit it out? Do I want to continue? And often when I give people a glass of wine and say, what do you think of, what do you think of it? They say, oh, I rather like it. And I say, no, 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 I wasn't talking about you. What do you think about that wine? And you're, you've got to get them to start focusing on it rather than just their own pleasure or displeasure, their own reaction. 
And that's hard to do. That's hard to learn to do, to draw attention away from yourself and your own hedonic experience. Mm, uh, and, and start paying attention to what is going on in the liquid, what's going on in the wine. Why is it giving me these sensations? What, what is it composed of? What, what's going on at different times as it enters your mouth, as you feel the sweetness as it comes into the mouth, the acidity building up, the bitterness at the back, the aftertaste, which is actually an after smell later. All of those things. So it turns out that we're wrong to suppose that tasting is very easy and immediate. Certainly we have immediate sensations. Certainly we have immediate <coughs> pleasures. But rather like looking at a painting in a gallery, your first impression might not always be your best one. You know, I think we've had the experience, you've got limited time, you go into a gallery, you walk around, and you kind of let whatever grabs your attention most guide you, and you walk towards that, and you spend a little bit of time in front of it, and you look to see if there's anything else that's equally appealing to you. But of course, you might have missed many things, which, with a bit of time, with a bit of stillness, and probably with a bit of help and guidance, somebody could have told you about or pointed things out in the painting that would bring it to life, and eventually you would come to see more and more. And eventually that might be more satisfying than your immediate reaction. So just in the way that we can discover more things about what's going on in our food or in, or in a glass of wine or a glass of beer. So similarly, listening to a piece of music or watching... Uh, 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 a play or seeing you know, a painting in front of us, the immediate liking or disliking can be a distraction, can be a bit of a distraction for finding out what is going on in this object that I'm contemplating, what am I getting out of it, what is it doing, and what is it doing to me and to others. So I think there's a way to rescue the aesthetics of taste to again have something which I'm very keen on, this idea that there's a continuum between tasting food, making judgments about the everyday experiences we have, how we arrange our homes and our tables, fashion, all the way up to judgments about fine art, painting, music, literature. There's a continuum, as long as you realize that we're not going from something very subjective and easy at the bottom to something very, very hard. They're all very hard and they take work and you usually need people who have found out what's going on there to guide you a little bit and to point things out to you. So is it the case that only some people can be so-called experts, good judges? No. Do we give up the democracy of taste that everybody's opinion counts? No. Everybody's opinion is valuable, but we should allow the idea that you can improve your taste, that you can refine your judgments, that your first judgments are not always your best. You can train your palate, but also you can train your level of observation and understanding of what you're attending to and engaging with. And for that, it just means it's not a division between those who are expert and those who are not. It's a division between those who are expert or experienced and those who are not yet expert or experienced. And the job of the expert, if they're good, is not to tell you they know and you don't. It's to try to open up and communicate and share with you insights that will allow you to develop your taste and your judgment to be able to extract more and enhance the experience you get out of all the aesthetic experiences in everyday life and beyond. Thank you. Cafe Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and Dance City. We're also supported by DC Cafe, who host the events.